four, four years. Okay, so I want to just go back to the, um, are you obliged under the law to be guided by government priorities? We set a national priorities through our national um, flagship program, so we are very focused on the national priorities and have been for, uh, for many uh, decades. We continue to do that and we set those national um, flagships in consultation with leaders at all levels, um, government, community, industry, uh, uh, as we look around the nation and set our strategic plan and our decadal strategic plan. So we are guided by national priorities. We would also be mindful um, if, uh, if uh, there was a setting of, uh, of national priorities um, at, the, at the national level, we would be clear as to how we would respond to those national priorities. Well, that's what I'm trying to understand here. So let me ask it another way. Has the CSIRO, purely on its own assessment, determined that Australia's long-term prosperity lies not in clean technology development and climate research, but rather in fossil fuels and resource extraction. Is that something you have determined no. by yourselves, or is that something that has come from the government's priorities? No, Senator, it doesn't reflect, in fact, our um, investment. For example, in our energy um, investment, our overall aim is an integrated research. We, uh, we have the aims of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, ensuring energy supply, ensuring an energy grid that is positioned for the future and maximising the country's wealth from our rich endowment of energy resources. We look to balance um, that in an integrated uh, research portfolio. So um, how has your flagship program structure for energy changed since last year? It lists in Appendix B, coal mining, oil, gas and fuels, unconventional gas, low emissions technology and grids and energy efficiency systems. What areas were they last year? Well, our portfolio covers emerging renewable energy, it covers stationary and transport energy options, it includes solar, it includes smart grids and it includes energy storage um, as well as future fuel options. So that remains um, our portfolio and as I mentioned we are looking to make sure that our portfolio covers the full spread of requirements for the nation. But isn't it fair to say with this restructuring that what we're seeing, as you've said in the annual direction statement, CSIRO will prioritise unconventional gas by reprioritising conventional gas and growing external revenues? We, with the investment that the nation is making in gas, in offshore gas, uh, with the um, projects that will be in the gas um, sector. Uh, all of those projects require technology and R&D uh, for both the production, uh, transport and processing of that. They also require safety. Uh, we are seeing um, our investment in gas will be maintained. We have uh, indicated that we will reduce our investment in some of the liquid fuel uh, products in some of the areas of carbon capture and storage, um, local energy systems and geothermal. We, uh, but it, it doesn't take away from our integrated uh, research uh, portfolio. Uh, for example, just recently, uh, we have had uh, a major breakthrough in um, solar concentrator work with our partner, Abin Goa, where we managed to have a world first in, uh, in the temperatures uh, that we could reach with the concentrator, and hence this is a major breakthrough to how we can store solar energy and of course it's the storage of that energy and it's released steadily into the grid, which has been a major barrier. We continue to focus on that and we'll look for commercialisation opportunities. So coming to climate research, given that CSIRO, along with the Bureau of Met, was one of the biggest um, participants in the climate change science program, uh, can you tell me what the budget cut implications are, uh, how much funding, uh, will uh, be gone from climate research, which areas of research will be cut, and how many climate researchers are set to lose their jobs? So there are actually two implications, Senator, so as well as the, uh, there's the government amalgamation of the National Environmental Research Program and the Australian Climate Change Research Program. Uh, they will now form the new National Environment Science uh, Program, um, and we understand there's uh, anticipated savings of 20 million. Uh, we have not worked through uh, the full uh, details of, uh, of that impact. CSIRO has made it very clear that we will continue the world-leading atmospheric and oceanographic science, including further development of our modelling, 
uh, through our access model with, with BOM, and we will be enhancing it, uh, working on um, to enhance the understanding of the key systems, uh, particularly that relate to Australia's weather and climate. Uh, we will be reporting to the nation, as we did this year, the state of the nation's climate, the state of the climate report uh, that we do in partnership with the Bureau of Meteorology. The next um, schedule for that will be 2016. Um, as you mentioned, we have signalled that we'll be integrating the work that we do um, across uh, different parts into a brand new flagship, which is the oceans and atmosphere, um, as of July. Uh, they're, they're, the teams are still working through that. There may be some, uh, some synergies, but it is an important area where CSIRO has world-class capability uh, and one of which we have responsibility nationally and globally in that area. We certainly do, but I don't understand why we are moving to these amalgamations and taking $20 million, uh, 20 million out of this research area. What is your reason for amalgamating uh, your marine oceans and atmosphere, for example? What's wrong with the way that it operates currently? Uh, let me just and clarify this goes the, to the $20 million was in reference to the government's amalgamation of the environmental programs and not our um, research okay, reduction. Secondly, the reason that we have amalgamated it is we've actually elevated it to the status of a flagship, which is the highest um, uh, priority for CSIRO. And we felt it was very important to bring together all of the work we do in oceans and atmosphere uh, into a single flagship and to elevate it to a national flagship status. Okay, and since it's so important in elevating it to a flagship status, are there any jobs to go or are there any cuts to the budget of oceans and atmosphere? Um, Senator, as I mentioned with Senator Carr, we are currently working through uh, those, uh, those areas. The main areas in the environmental um, area that we have, have um, signalled is in the urban uh, water area. I'm just referring to my notes to make sure I give you the proper um, the, the proper area. So the, the areas that uh, uh, we will reduce our appropriation investment in urban water and as I said we will focus some of the world leading work we do in biodiversity um, and also as I said aggregate the work we do in climate science. In terms of um, the implications um, and you asked me about job numbers, our leaders and managers are currently working through that. They're also working through in discussions with our external partners. They're also working through the implications of the other decisions um, that have been made. And, uh, and once we have worked through that, we will actually have clarity in the next few months of uh, the detailed implications as it relates to jobs. But why would we be considering losing jobs from ocean and atmosphere if climate change is the priority and flagship uh, is to elevate the significance of this area of work? I think that's probably a comment rather than a question, isn't it, Senator? Well, no, I'm, I'm <coughs> asking a straight question. If, it, if, if you're saying it's elevated, it's going to a flagship, that oceans and atmosphere, uh, atmospheric research is, in, is so important, why are you considering slashing jobs in that area? And We're not considering that slashing jobs in that area. I think I've been very clear with where we are looking to reduce. Because we've had that, that, uh, um, that science operated through uh, a division, we've also had uh, work that was being undertaken in the flagship. We've also had uh, work that was being undertaken in our work from oceans. As we bring those together, there may be um, areas where, uh, where we do have synergies uh, and we don't quite need as, as, many, as many roles and we will be looking at that. Uh, that doesn't take, that's really operating in the most efficient and effective manner as we bring this together. Um, I, uh, I think I've been very clear that we see this as a national priority, the work we do in oceans and atmosphere and have elevated as such. Okay, so so Senator, just I, I, I just think we need to be cautious about um, <clears throat> using emotive language such as slashing. I think what Dr. Clark has said that they, these are being considered at the moment and anything beyond that is hypothetical. I just don't know whether it's terribly helpful for the staff if we... Uh, I, think, I think Dr. Clark has been... Quite, jobs. I'd, I'd has, has been... Has been, has been, has been <coughs> oh, sorry, there's a bit of a noise behind you. Yeah. I'm trying to engage you, Senator Milne. Um, uh, so I just think we need to be very careful about the language. Do Dr. Clark has said we're looking at this. We know there's been some 300 job losses under the previous government. So I just think we need to be a bit careful with it. OK, well, I th thank you, Minister. I'll use the Prime Minister's term that obviously is not emotional, and that's axe. Yes, axe he's, he's, axe very axe good, he's very good at axe. axe so I'll use axe term. in future as non 
uh, inflammatory <coughs> language. So I'll just uh, move on to uh, Aspendale in particular. I'm aware Senator Carr asked a couple of questions about that before, but that is a marine and atmospheric research staff base. Um, can you tell me, uh, and Senator Carr did ask how many will be relocated as opposed to how many people will be offered redundancy. Um, can, you, can you just give me any more detail on that, but particularly uh, won't the closure of Aspendale disrupt CSIRO's research into climate change? Our position on Aspendale hasn't changed for, for many years. As I've mentioned, we've had a long-term um, intent and signal to uh, consolidate in our capital cities and, uh, and in particular Melbourne. Uh, we have uh, and signalled that we would be looking to consolidate Aspendale eventually into Clayton. We have no date, um, and in fact we have um, at the moment no funds to, uh, to be able to, to do that. So it, it, it is not correct to, um, to signal uh, that anything has changed in regard to Aspendale as a result of the budget. Can you tell me about the Marine Division in Hobart then? You referred earlier to the importance of marine research and you mentioned uh, Hobart. I'm interested to know how many jobs are slated to go from uh, CSI's, CSIRO operations in Tasmania in Hobart. Yeah, Hobart, we have been actively working to build Hobart as one of the largest concentrations of marine and atmospheric science in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, together with the University of Tasmania and, uh, and together with the Antarctic Division. Uh, we have the new funding for the vessel, so the vessel will dock uh, in, in Hobart in the, uh, in the middle of the year, all things um, uh, going extremely well. And, uh, and we will continue to build um, Hobart and, uh, and look to see how we work effectively with those partners. Um, so we have made a very strong commitment strategically to Hobart and to making sure that it's there. In terms of your question, uh, in, reg in relation to the impact of, of the budget, um, we will need to work through that over the next few uh, few months to be clear on uh, any roles uh, in, in Hobart. Um, so I, I cannot provide that for you right now. Okay. Um, Senator Wish-Wilson had a couple of other specific Tasmanian questions. Yeah. Or... Thank, thank you. 